You ever have one of those moments where like two seconds before you have to go do one thing, like something else starts, like you're having a really good conversation and it's picking up speed and momentum. And then all of a sudden you look at the time and you're like, oh shit, I have to go do this thing. And somehow you feel terrible about pausing a really engaging conversation. You ever have that moment? Like that's, that literally happened. I was ready to like delay five minutes so I could finish this other conversation. And then the other person realized like, oh, you have to go do a thing. And I'm, I have fumbled my way out of one thing and into this thing. And hi, how are you? What's going on? Everybody good? You having a nice day? I don't know where you are at, but if you're here, the weather is gorgeous. It is warm and sunny. I'm wearing shorts for the first time this year, and it feels amazing. I am thrilled to be here and so excited to be talking about this stuff. I had an experience before we get started. I had an experience that sort of prompted this because somebody asked me, Hey, you're doing more stuff on YouTube. That's great. And Hey, why are you doing this and not the usual Q and a you normally do? Let me tell you over the last couple of weeks, we've covered stuff like, uh, writing exercises and we've covered sort of breakdowns on things. And we talked about stakes the other week and somebody asked me, I don't remember who it was. Otherwise I would give them like direct named credit. They said something truly mind blowing to me. This is all great. They said, but how do I write it? And I, I've always struggled with answering that question because I, being somebody who's been doing this 25 years, I just kind of assume everybody knows that part. Because when you go online, you go sit on social media, you go scroll around writing advice. Nobody really talks about the writing part. They talk about the abstract. They talk about the theory. They talk about the publishing part. And if we're going to talk about writing, we're going to complain about it. We're going to talk about how it's going too slowly or doing this or doing that, or how you just need to have this thing and write it and then that thing and write it, but not the how, not the technical stuff, not the roll your sleeves up and get your hands dirty and make up a story on the page kind of thing. I've always assumed people just knew how to do that. And the more I work with people who were just getting started in their writing journey, the more I work with first time authors, the more I work with people who are in need of an edit or in need of more than just, Hey, rah, rah, good job. You're doing great kind of stuff. The more I see there is a real need to talk about how to make this happen and how to write that down and what this means and what that means. So over the last couple of weeks, instead of answering a million questions in a million different directions, I wanted to try focusing on it. That's why this has been coming up more and more. And honestly, I think that's why this will continue to come up more and more. So ladies and gentlemen, guys, gals, non-binary pals, friends, writers, makers, doers, dreamers, pantsers, plotters, enthusiasts, scoundrels, scallywags, pirates, dancers, smokers, shoppers, jugglers, juggalos, clowns, stupid enthusiasts, anybody who's had lunch yet, people who need to remember to take their afternoon meds, anybody who had to vacuum today, people who have not done the dishes yet, and most importantly, the comrades. Hello. Hi. I'm John. It's good to see you again. Uh, if you don't know who I am, if this is the first time you're checking me out, I'm John. Uh, I'm a writing coach and an editor, and it is my job to help you write better. I've been doing this job more than half my life, over, you know, 20 something years, and I love doing this. I think I'm pretty good at it, and I'm hoping I can share with you some of the things I have learned and some of the things I've been teaching to help you love it just as much as I do. And today, today, we're doing something very crunchy and hands-on, but don't get intimidated. Don't freak out. It's not that bad. We're going to make it simple. Today, I want to try and answer the question, how do I write this for five separate writing things, common things, basic ground level stuff that you've probably heard people talk about, but not exactly in the way of like, what do I do? Like, how do I do it? Well, how do I do it better? How do I not make this mistake or that mistake? I want to walk you through five ways to write stuff. I want to help you finish that chapter, get that thing started, get that thing finished, write the draft, do what you want to do, master and understand the movie that's in your head that you're trying to get on the page for somebody else. 
That's my challenge today. And I'm very, very excited to do it because I think it's going to be interesting. I think it's going to be fun. So I know the slide says five parts of one scene, but I have to let you in on a little secret. It's actually easier to teach this with five separate scenes. So I hope you don't mind, but there are five separate scenes from completely different stuff that I totally made up in order to illustrate the point. Otherwise it would just feel a little weird. So we're going to go through five separate things. We're going to start with a very common thing and we're going to work our way through harder and harder stuff, more complicated stuff and keep it simple the entire time so that you get a sense of here's how I do this thing. Here's how I can do it better. Here's what this thing is defined that everybody talks about, but we never talk about a definition. You'll see. It'll be great. I think you're going to love it. And if you have questions, if you are watching this live right now on YouTube and you have questions, let me know. I'd be more than happy to stop and answer whatever questions you have. If you're watching this sort of after the fact on YouTube, just leave comments down below. I'll answer your questions. And if you're listening to this on the, uh, on the podcast that it will later become, you know, find me on social media and ask all the questions you have. I'd be more than happy to help. So are we ready? We're going to do this. And we're going to get started with exposition. Oh man, I wish I had more sound effects loaded for this, but YouTube and Twitch handle my sound compression and stuff differently. So here we are, we're doing exposition and we're going to start with a really nice, straightforward definition. Exposition is all the stuff that is not dialogue and not what a character is thinking. It's everything else, everything else. It's all the descriptions. It's all the movements. It's all the weather. It's all the sentences about birds and bugs and grass and fires and evenings and mornings. And if it's not dialogue and it's not a thought, it's exposition. Now that said, I've really, really simplified it down because you can get way ridiculously lost in the weeds learning about different kinds of exposition and the different variations and why this thing is not exposition and why that thing is. And I have to tell you, none of those things are really important. None of those things are going to help you write whatever chapter you're writing or whatever scene you're writing or start whatever story you want to start. The name and the terms, it's kind of one of those things that we used to use in like a who's smarter than who, how do we outrank each other kind of way. But at the end of the day, if you don't need to know it, it's not going to help you. You need to know that exposition is sort of the majority of what you're going to write. You are going to be writing more exposition than anything else, no matter how many books you write. It's the majority of, well, everything. It's all your stage directions. It's all your everything. If it's not thought or spoken, exposition. There are different types. Usually we have plot exposition, character exposition, and world building exposition. And it's pretty much what it says in the name. Plot exposition is the stuff that talks about your plot. Character exposition is the stuff that talks about your character. World building exposition is the stuff that talks about your world. And it could be anything. What it is, what's going on, what's going to happen next. You know, as long as it's not a thought and not talking, hey, guess what? It's exposition. Now you can break this down into what, who, and where. Plot exposition is your what. Character exposition is your who. World exposition is your where. Simple, straightforward. Now, does this matter? Is this, is this going to be like on a quiz or on a test? Not really. But is it helpful for you? Why, do, why does this matter? What's this going to do for you? Well, if you're writing what you're writing, let's say you've got that action scene. Let's say you've got that scene where the two characters hook up after a tearful confession in the rain. Let's say you've got a scene where the knight has to go charge into the dungeon. You want to make sure you, whatever kind of exposition you're framing, whatever way you're organizing the scene, we're going to talk about that more later when we get into scene development, but you want to make sure your exposition is doing its best job possible to put a movie in the reader's brain, cinematically, the movement. It's not just a statement of here is a sentence with this fact. Here is a sentence with that fact. Here is a sentence where I talk about the tree. Here is a sentence where I talk about the dirt. 
It's not about ticking off lots of boxes on a checklist. It's not about writing things in an unsmooth sort of stiff, you know, that, you know, that way a little kid will stand in front of an elementary school class and badly read a book report. And they won't look down at their audience. They've got their face on the page and they're just reading very stiffly. We don't want that. We want no part of that. We can do better than that. And one of the ways we can do that is by understanding what we're talking about when we're talking about whatever. Exposition is your primary go-to for all the stuff you're going to do. So exposition, the kind doesn't matter because we're not going to get a grade. It's most important to understand that in the reader's mind, there's a screen. There's a movie they're trying to imagine. And it's blank. If you don't fill it with imagery, if you don't frame it with mood and atmosphere and color and texture and sound and description of stuff, there's no visual. If you just do a lot of dialogue, we'll talk about dialogue in a minute, but if you just do dialogue, there's sound for the movie. That's great. But there's no picture. It's about learning how you individually as a writer balance the amount of talking you need with the amount of describing you need. Now, I know you've got the picture in your head. You have it in there. You, when you write a sentence, you know what you mean. When you say the forest is, you know, stormy and full of, you know, urgency, you know what you mean. But you've got to remember the reader wants to know what you mean. And you have to make an effort to kind of build a bridge and share with them what you mean so that they can go, oh, I understand. It's not going to be a one-to-one sort of like copy, save, file thing where they're going to get it exactly right all the time. Sometimes they will. Sometimes they won't. That's not your problem, and that's not a sign that you're at fault. It's just an idea that you've got to put a movie in their head, some visual, some sound, some movement, and we keep going. So I've got some examples. It goes like this. The world is a cold place. It is an unforgiving city ruled by people in suits who care more for economies and profits than people. The world long ago traded compassion for commerce unless someone does something, unless I do something. But I'm just one person, one guy wearing a name tag and working in an office, one guy who lives in a tiny apartment where I can hear my neighbors fighting or screwing and where I'm greeted every morning by a different rat scampering across my wooden floor. I have to do something. There's your example. That's exposition. It's a little bit of a lot of different exposition. There's some world building in there when we talked about the world being a cold place and we talked about it being an unforgiving city. There's some character exposition because we talked about how somebody has to do something and the I, the character, have to do something. We also got a little bit of plot because that something needs to be done. And it can move seamlessly like that. Notice I didn't have a paragraph where it was, I'm in my apartment. There is a rat on the floor. I know I'm simplifying that down maybe too much, but you don't always have to start your reader from like zero to 60. And you don't have to start your reader into just like boom, bang, the camera turns on, the screen goes up in their mind. And here is a very immediate boxy shot. Here's a couch. Here is a window. Here is a potted plant. You can do that. It's okay to do that. It's not wrong to do that. But you don't always and only have to do that. We're not, you know, setting up a, a, a stiff. Remember those dioramas we used to do in school where you had like a shoebox and you stuck little action figures or Lego guys or something in there and you, you sort of like painted a very, or you go to a museum and you see them you know, like sort of behind glass or whatever. These mannequins are in locked positions. We don't necessarily always and only want to do that. Sometimes the most potent stuff we can do as part of our exposition is as much mood and atmosphere as it is describing the apartment and the rat and the neighbors and the thinness of the walls and the name tag. Now, the more concrete we get with those details, the more I tell you that it's this color rat or it's that kind of couch or it has this many cushions, the more concrete and specific the visuals get, that's called descriptive exposition. I told you there's a couple different kinds of exposition. The opposite, sort of, it's easiest to think about this in terms of extremes on a, on a, a line. 
One end is descriptive. You can get really bogged down in descriptive. Most people, when they're learning how to write, go real heavy on descriptive because it's easiest. Here's a chair. There's this many chairs. Here's a table. Here's how many windows. This is the weather. This is this. This is that. It's easiest because they're translating the picture in their brain, not necessarily exactly directly, but they're, they've got a visual and they're just repeating it. Descriptive, straightforward, simple, useful. The other end of the pool, though, the deeper end, the far end, the other end of the spectrum is called impressionistic exposition. This is harder generally because it's people aren't comfortable thinking this way. They, they get it, they feel it, but it's hard to nail down because it's not anchored in those descriptions. It's not so much. There are four couch cushions and a pizza box and there's this much pizza in it and it's raining and there's this window pane. It's more about how it feels and the idea that lays through the visual and lays through the, the, the structure of the exposition is more of an impression. It's more of a mood, a vibe, as the kids say. It's there, but it's not as concrete and specific. You can't quite put your finger on it, but you know you've read something that has given you some sense to fill in the screen in your imagination. We can see that here. When we talk about the world is a cold place, I'm not describing it in the sense of like, it's winter, it's this many degrees outside. It's a mood. It's an atmosphere. It's a cold place. Things feel cold. Whether you want to take that literally or not is up to you. I partner that with the next sentence. It's an unforgiving city because I want to partner the idea of cold and unforgiving together. Those are two impressionistic ideas because I don't need to have a scene where somebody goes, oh, burr, it's cold. Or we have a scene where two people walk past each other and they make no kind of recognition of one another. And I don't need a scene where in order to get a communicate that it's unforgiving or somebody comes out right and says, I don't forgive you because that's silly. We can do better than that. We can do different than that. But because I went impressionistic early, one sentence, then second sentence, I'm kind of on the hook. I'm kind of required. There's no hard and fast rule, but it would benefit the movie and the reader's mind if I suddenly got either more direct and pointed in my impressionism and said, hey, focus on this thing. Not just the world, not just the city, which are big and broad nebulous things. But if I need to zero you in and focus you on something, that's gotta come in the third sentence. It's just leading you forward down a train of thought. So the third sentence, ruled by people in suits who care more for economies and profits than people. Just the first half of that sentence. Yeah, you could argue that it should be two sentences. I'll take that copy edit from you. But the point is, the first half of that sentence is more focused than the world and an unforgiving city, because who knows what city I'm talking about. I might be talking about New York City, Los Angeles, Madrid, uh, Rome, or anywhere else. It could be anything. It could be anywhere. But the minute I start dialing you into people in suits, and specifically further still, people in suits who care more for economies and profit— there's a picture in your head. Doesn't matter of whom, but there's a picture in your head. You picture a certain kind of person. I haven't described them. I didn't say they're this tall or that they're wearing this kind of shoes, but somehow I've managed to put a picture in your brain. I'm not doing anything magical. I'm not, you know, suddenly cheating or, or waving some kind of magic wand. I'm just allowing you to have an impression. Sometimes our best description for something isn't always concrete. Sometimes, though, we'll get concrete. We'll get concrete in the next paragraph. But if we're staying impressionistic, we can continue this idea and give you sort of a mood for the whole space, the whole story, which is the back half of this sentence. The world long ago traded compassion for commerce. That's a statement. That is a statement that describes how the character perceives the world. It is taken as true because we don't have anything else to go by. We don't see some other character's thoughts. We don't see more exposition. It's just one paragraph on a slide. So we have to look at who's saying this thing and what is this thing that they're saying help us picture in our minds. Somebody out there, let me know if I've gone too technical and I've lost you. Because if I have, I want to make sure you stay on track. That's important to me. This isn't just John's going to yammer on for two hours. I want to make sure this is like clicking. So let me know if it is. Say something, anything. Back to the second half of this sentence. 
if a character, particularly in first person, that's I, if a character can use exposition to serve as a way of giving you insight into how they see the world, it is simultaneously going to be biased because they're picking and choosing. I is picking and choosing what they are going to say, but it is also objective because it's the only thing they're talking about. They're basically saying, see the world this way, no matter what, no matter what goes on, remember, you and me, reader, reader, and narrating character, you and me, reader, we're in this together. Here's the lens through which we're going to view this movie. Let's go. And then we bring this first paragraph to a close by setting up a kind of tension. It's useful. Tension's great. We're going to talk about tension, you know, later on um, when we cover something called reactions. That's way later. But for now, understand that tension and exposition fuel one another. If I tell you there's a problem, I get to describe what that problem is. I get to describe how the characters are going to solve it. I get to describe how the way that I set things up creates more tension and it kind of cycles around each other. So I have those last two sentences in this first paragraph. Unless someone does something. Unless I do something. Why did I separate those two sentences? Because I want that last sentence to be sort of a gut punch, to have an impact. You can do that. You can make a one-sentence paragraph. Your English teacher isn't going to rise from the grave and yell at you. That's just not going to happen. But one thing I want to point out here is that these two sentences do something called focusing. Focusing is an expositive exposition trick, skill, tool, whatever you want to call it, that we can do to make a character make a more concrete point without having a ridiculous moment of like sitting there or standing there and giving some lengthy monologue. Unless someone does something is broad. Someone, anybody, you there, over there in the corner, anybody. But if we go from someone to I, now we've focused in, we've made the, this problem, this drive specific to the character, unless I do something. So now in the course of this one paragraph, we've painted a big impressionistic picture of the world and the city we're in. Then we focused a little bit and gave an impressionistic picture of the, the people who were sort of set against our antagonists. And then we focused up with, you know, who the narrator is and what they're driven to do. And that's just the first example. We still have one more example to go. Let's keep digging. Let's see what else we got. But I'm just one person. We're pivoting. This is called a pivot. We're going to shift focus away from how one thing was to this whole other new thing. I'm just one person. Now we're going to talk about the limitations, the fears. Remember, we're creating tension. So I'm just one person. I'm one guy wearing a name tag and working in an office. Concrete details there, name tag, office. But it's still slightly impressionistic because I didn't tell you what floor and what building on what street at what time. I didn't tell you exactly what job it is. Why? Well, you don't always need to know all the details all at once in every paragraph. I got a whole book. I got hundreds of thousands of words, possibly, or tens of thousands of words, maybe, to get a whole story across to you. It doesn't all need to be in the first sentence every time or the eighth sentence every time. I got plenty of words. Let's use them all. But I can, I can keep going. I can stay at this level of description. I don't have to move the camera in and get more concrete. I don't have to move the camera way out and stay vaguely abstract. I can kind of ride that middle for a little bit to give you a little bit of detail, but also a little bit of an impression at the same time. I'm one guy who lives in a tiny apartment. Oh, concrete detail, tiny, where I can hear my neighbors fighting or screwing. Okay, now there are neighbors. Now all of a sudden I've created context for our character. Creating context through exposition helps a reader feel more connected to whatever it is we're describing because now we're not living in like a Star Trek holodeck where there's just like nothing. And it's just the, we only picture this one thing under a spotlight and everything else is just black or white or flat. No, now we're creating context. We're building a world. I'm trying to illustrate that movie in your brain. Fighting or screwing and where I'm greeted every morning by a different rat scampering across my wooden floor. Wooden floor, detail, descriptive. But I've also set a mood because a morning where I'm greeted by a different rat feels a certain way. You picture a certain thing. Did I detail the color of the rat? Did I talk about how big it is? No. Could I have? Sure. Was it necessary right now? No. It's always going to be best for you to reach a synthesis, a combo platter of descriptive and impressionistic exposition. 
Sure. You can lean on more one more than the other. You can have an 80, 20 mix, a 70, 30, a 45, 55, whatever. It's never going to be 50, 50 because it's really hard to nail that down. And it's very rarely going to be a hundred and zero. There's a whole big gray area in between, and it's totally fine to be in that gray space. The majority of the time it's fine. The goal isn't to sit here and try and be right. I'm making air quotes. We're not trying to get an A on a test. We're just trying to put a movie in the reader's brain. And the best way for you to do that is to not over engineer every sentence. Nobody cares as much as you do. You're thinking it has to be a certain way. You're thinking it has to be perfect. It doesn't. No one's going to know what perfect is because they're coming from a position, the reader is, where they don't know anything. The screen's been blank. You're filling it in. Anything you put down that fills it in at all, they're going to assume, oh, well, that's perfect. That's what they wanted. There is no technical perfect that you need to keep chasing. It's not helping. No one asked you to do that. You're putting too much pressure on yourself. Knock that off. Back to our example, because there's a closer here that ties our two paragraph examples together. And there's this sentence, I have to do something. It's coming back again. And the first time we brought it back, we had, unless I do something. It's sort of open-ended. It's broad, unless I do something. But now here it's specific. I have to do something. Focusing down again. And we've sort of taken this to these two focusing ideas and we've parked them at the end of the paragraph. Why? Because I'm trying to build a rhythm and a connection with the reader. That'd be you. I'm trying to build that, that bridge between what's in my head and how the story feels and what vibe I want to get across with you who doesn't know any better. Not because you're stupid, just because you don't know. I have to do something with me so far. Does this work? We good? Cause I'm going to keep going. Dialogues next. I, I do want to point out before we go any further, loads of people swear to me up and down all day long. They are great at dialogue or they think their dialogue is really strong and frequently it's strong, but they're not necessarily great at it. Most of the time what happens is people acquire a set of skills for writing dialogue based on the fact that they watch a lot of media. They watch a lot of anime. They watch a lot of streaming stuff. They watch the same thing over and over and over again. They read a lot of screenplays. They watch a lot of movies. They play a lot of video games. They consume a lot where the talking happens and the visual is being handled by something else, a camera, actors on a screen with direction and all that stuff. So they think the dialogue is just talking sort of isolated in a vacuum. This is the problem because it's not. Dialogue does not exist in a vacuum. It is the soundtrack to the movie I'm trying to put in your brain, but it doesn't live isolated by itself. Dialogue. Everybody's dialogue. I don't care if we're talking about your main character, your secondary character, Jimmy, the guy who pours coffee in chapter five. Doesn't matter who it is. Dialogue is a reaction. Somebody says something because they're reacting to something. Something just happened in the scene. Something is currently in the middle of happening. It feels like something could happen. A character feels a certain way. A character is thinking something and it's going to prompt talking. There's, there's an idea we'll get to when we talk about interactions where things operate in levels. So characters think and feel things. That's their base level. You can even argue that character feeling is the most base level, but it doesn't really matter. Characters think and feel things. Eventually they think and feel things so much they have to express their thinking and feeling through dialogue. That's the second level. But eventually thinking and feeling and talking isn't enough. They have to physically react with their world. That's the third level. Now, whether that physical reaction means running away from the monster or um, reaching and walking across to the, you know, grab somebody and pull them away or, or, you know, touch their hand or kiss them or shoot a gun or whatever. There's always a physical action. 
For my theater friends, you'll notice that this is really similar to the same structure that you see with a musical. A character feels something so much that they have to talk, then they feel it too much and they have to sing, and then they feel it so much they still have to dance. Same kind of progression, always moving from dialogue as a reaction towards something else. Dialogue is a reaction. And if you want to nail down better sounding dialogue, understand and constantly ask yourself, okay, this character is talking. What are they reacting to? Dialogue's other major driver, its big rule, is that it should always sound like people talking. That doesn't mean they need to have like a lot of slang. It doesn't mean they need to sound modern. If you're writing a period piece, they don't need to like run around talking to them, you know, what sounds sus or whatever, or who has Riz in a Jane Austen novel. It's more a matter of it should just sound like how two people would communicate with one another. It should sound as natural as possible. How does it sound? It is not, and I want to like underline this like a million times. It is not a transcript. It does not need to account for Every single mouth sound, all the ums and oh and well and uh, mm, mm, all those sounds that we try to write down by like H M M M M M or U M or E R M or O P E or W E L P or anything like that, that seems to dominate sort of our casual conversation in online spaces. You don't actually need to write most of that stuff down. Why? Because the reader should be able to put it in them, you know, park it in themselves. Oh, this character is in a moment, in a context, in a scene where they're feeling nervous. Chances are they're going to probably start this sentence with, um, it doesn't have to be on the page in order for me to hear. I bet this guy who's really nervous about proposing to his girlfriend, I bet he's probably gone, um, at some point. It's okay. It's not a transcript. Good dialogue is not stiff. Good dialogue just sounds like somebody talking. You don't have to over-engineer it. You don't have to follow like exact perfect grammar. I don't speak with perfect grammar. My job all day is to work with writers and reading and sentences. I know grammar. I don't think I'm perfect at it, but I know it. But when I'm just talking to you, I use fragments. I drop words out of sentences because you know what I mean. I don't have a fantastic diction. I'm not using, you know, super clear language or the subject and object of my sentence are not always easily visible because dialogue breaks or cheats most rules of grammar because it's just communicating. One more point about that, especially for my overly literal writing friends, you don't have to lean so hard on punctuation. You know how when you're writing a sentence and sometimes you're going to have a dialogue tag like shouted, he, you know, run, he shouted. A lot of times, well, run's a bad example because it's just one word. But a lot of times you'll park and lean really heavily on like a question mark or an exclamation point in order to communicate how the whole sentence should be heard. You don't have to. I mean, use the punctuation that is most effective for the situation you're in. But you don't always have to like over overdo punctuation. I think it's probably the best way to say it. You don't need 10 million dot, dot, dots. You, you don't. Please don't. You're going to drive your copy editor up a wall. You, you don't need to do that. If you're trying to suggest that, you know, the character is having these long pauses between things, just trust, the, the, trust that you've written a sentence that the reader can go, oh, in this situation where you've already established that the character is nervous, that there's some amount of pausing between these words. Again, it's not a transcript. You don't need to try and get it perfect. You're not trying to earn an A on a test. We are just trying to communicate. Now, is there something wrong with a dot, dot, dot? No, but you don't need to use them nearly as much as most people do. Same with exclamation points and tarot bangs, question marks, shit like that. You don't need to. It's okay. Use them a little, use them sparingly. They're sprinkles on your Sunday as opposed to a primary constituent. Let's look at some examples. You shouldn't be in here. 
Her voice wasn't on edge as I expected. Neither was her face. She was not the rat-faced banshee Marvin made her out to be. It's been a really lousy three-day weekend, I said. She walked across the room, her eyes never leaving me. It felt invasive. It felt predatory. In that moment, I wanted to toughen up, but frankly, I was tired. You're a really annoying son of a bitch, you know that, she said. Yeah, well, tell me something I don't know. There's our example. Let's talk about the highlights. Notice that there's only two dialogue tags. Said. I didn't go out of my way to come up with a different verb. I didn't go out of my way to make it clear so that he said, she said, I said, I said, I said. Nope. Said, in particular, as a dialogue verb, benefits from something called invisibility. Lots of things in writing fall under this umbrella of invisible, meaning that if we see it enough times and we know, oh, it's a talking scene, we know not to like stumble so hard over said. It, it's an invisible said. It's just kind of there, and we use it, and it's not that big a deal because it's just stuff said. We didn't go to shouted, ejaculated, um, hollered. I mean, there's a time and place for those verbs because those verbs are particular. You know, they're going to suggest something extra, a, a volume, a directive, a, an amount, an energy, something like that. Nine times out of 10, though, people are just saying things, and it doesn't need to be more than that. Said is invisible. We know it's there. Sometimes we write it down. Sometimes we don't. Now, let's zoom out and look at our, at our big picture, though. Effective dialogue and effective efficacy is really the thing we're aiming at as much as possible. Not good, not right, but effective. In a scene, any scene, and we'll talk about scene development shortly. In a scene, the reader always wants to feel like they're in the room. Like that song in Hamilton, they want to be in the room where it happens. They just want to be there and have the, the characters and action revolving around them in and above and through and near and next to them the whole time. They want to feel like they're there, invisible, like a tourist, like a spy, like a voyeur. So effective dialogue helps make the current moment where the reader is parked in the scene feel real. You don't have to overexplain things. You don't have to, you know, have everybody talk in these long, complicated things. You know, in 1945, when I was doing this and your mother wore that dress and then that guy drove a car and the car had the... No. No. Remember, dialogue has to sound like people talking. If you, in your life, wherever you're at, could not conceivably run into somebody somewhere having this exact conversation, you've done it wrong. Effective dialogue is a contributor to the overall movie. It's the soundtrack to the visual. It's, the, it's another layer. It's another level. It is not the only thing or the biggest thing you want the reader to focus on. So if you're out there writing and you've got page after page after page of just talking, just chains of, of, of sentences and quotes and stuff, you're missing the boat. You just are. We want to, we want to, how do I say this? Let me jump down here. Hang on one second while I structure my next thought. Because I missed a slide. That's what I'm looking for. So you want to make sure, I'm going to try and do this from memory without the slide. I should have double checked this. The reason why you don't only want to dominate the page with excessive sentences inside quotation marks is because way too many writers way too often forget that while people are talking, the rest of the world of the story is still happening. Time does not freeze just because people are talking. Now, I know fantasy writers out there, you've probably got conversations with supernatural beings where time does stop. I get it. But that's not the norm, and that's not true for everybody in every story. So when we just have these lengthy chains of just this person talks, that person talks, this person talks, that whoever they are, that person talks, back and forth and back and forth, and then you throw more people in the mix, we are putting more focus on the sound of the movie in our head, and the visual dims away, just kind of goes away, and 
Eventually the reader kind of loses track of what am I supposed to be picturing? What's going on right now? We've got all this talking. You don't want to get bogged down in all the talking. That's not the point. We're in the current moment. We only have this current moment, wherever we're at on this page, in this scene, in this chapter, there's only this current moment. I know you, the writer have in your head, like 30 coming up moments. This is going to happen. There's going to be a dinosaur. There's going to be a plane crash. There's going to be a sex scene. There's going to be this, there's going to be that. I get it. But the reader can only read one thing at a time. They're only right here. So let's make sure while they're here on this page in this scene, we give them the best movie for however long it takes them to read this page. Then they'll go to the next page and they'll read the best movie again. You only stay in the current moment. and The characters only know and can only talk about and react to what they know at that time and what baggage they're bringing along the way. They don't know what's going to happen in chapter 11. They don't need to foreshadow what's going to happen in chapter 11. They don't need to stop and make sure you, the reader, understand, hey, you know, somebody's going to betray that guy. You don't need to say that. There's no reason for that. You don't need to tip your hand so early. The reader is reading your story. They're, they bought in. They want to be entertained. They want to have the experience of the movie just rolling out in front of them the way you would if you were watching a movie. If somebody stopped every two seconds and made sure you were okay and made sure everything's all right, and then told you like, okay, expect the next 10 things, your enjoyment would be lessened. We don't, we don't want to do that with our dialing. We want to make sure that here we are in the moment where characters are expressing themselves and reacting to things of the present moment. Do not get bogged down in the dialogue tags. They can be very helpful but they are not universally 100% all the time critical. Sometimes, like if we have two people talking and we've already established a one person speaks, then the other person responds back and forth and back and forth. You don't need all the saids. You don't need all the asked if somebody asks a question in this mix. And sometimes when you ask a question, you don't even need asked. You can use said. It's fine. Why? Different meaning, different context. Don't overthink the verb. Have it if you want. Most important, more than anything else, more than the rightness of how you've written it, I'm making air quotes, is that the moment, the movie in the reader's head continues to play and continues to engage them. Everything else kind of goes over there and waits its turn. But do not freeze the world just to have your characters talk. It can be super useful to have sentences where we make it clear that, oh yeah, the world's still happening. That's why we have sentences in this example where we talk about, you know, she walks across the room and her eyes never leave me. And we can express the reaction. It felt invasive. It felt predatory to give you a sense of what you should feel as the reader being the tourist, the invisible voyeur in this room. The dialogue is part of the overall picture. And we don't always have to qualify how someone says a thing by modifying what they're saying. If I give one of these people a Southern accent, for instance, uh, I should be more clear, a Southern American accent. I don't have to write out the draw and change the structure of the words to reflect that. I don't need to add in all the AWs and the AHs and the OUHs and all that stuff. Or I don't need to swap all the R's for A-H so that sugar becomes sugar. Don't need to do any of that. That's really offensive. Knock that off if you're doing that. You're better than that. Your reader deserves better than that. So instead, the other way of doing this is to take exposition sentences after the dialogue to qualify and explain the dialogue we just read. You shouldn't be in here. Okay, your reader's naturally going to ask, how am I supposed to hear this? Because I see the words, I get the idea, but what does it sound like? Well, here come your next sentences to explain that. Her voice wasn't on edge as I expected. Okay, so I know not to hear that on edge. What other detail can you give me? Neither was her face. Okay, so her face isn't on edge. Now I got a visual to go with the sound. Great. Three sentences in and I've got a picture and sound. My movie's playing nicely. She was not the rat-faced banshee Marvin made her out to be. Now, that's a contextual sentence that depends on 
at some point, a guy named Marvin described her as a rat faced banshee, but it helps give us some context. It helps set up some expectations. It helps put something of a movie, something of a picture for the movie in your head. And then when I've sort of packaged all those thoughts together, I move to the next line of dialogue. It's been a really lousy three day weekend. I said, great. What do I follow that up with action movement? Remember there's a world happening. So that's how we get to the walk across the room sentences. We can in first person, particularly you have this ability to regularly check in with your character. The character's thoughts become narration. Narration is a kind of exposition. Your character's thoughts are how the world is for the character. So a sentence like, but frankly, I was tired, tells us a lot about how the character feels in the moment, but also gives us an idea of how to color our dialogue, eyes dialogue. Because how would a tired person say, it's been a really lousy three-day weekend? That's something we can manage. That's something we can understand. It doesn't need to be like extra spelled out. Trust your reader to understand that when you say tired, it's going to tint the ideas around it. And then we have more dialogue. She calls him an annoying son of a bitch. And then we have a snappy response because I wrote this and I like snappy responses to dumb shit. So that's how we are at where we're at. This is dialogue. It's pretty straightforward. It's just a reaction. It's just about engaging the reader and having them go, okay, I'm in a room with these characters. This is the situation going on. These are the people expressing themselves. Go. Notice I don't have sentences where I stop and go, I feel nervous. I could. I totally could. I could detail that in as much, you know, as many words as I want. But there's also something to be said for learning that restraint and pulling back sometimes. Sometimes I want to tell you, oh, character feels nervous. That's fine. That's legit. No problem. But if I wanted to not be so overt about it, I could spend the whole paragraph describing things in a way that conveys nervousness without having the word nervous show up on the page. It's a choice. It's not, it doesn't mean one's better than the other. It doesn't mean I'm more creative or more artistic or a better writer if I don't do it that way. It's just a choice. Sometimes I can go straight. Sometimes I can make a big old swirly path. Doesn't matter. Our goal here is to communicate more movie into the reader's head. You're going to get real tired of hearing me say that for sure. Shall we keep going? Exposition and dialogue are the, in, a, in our walkthrough here, they're the shallower end of our pool. They're stuff you're always going to encounter. You're going to write exposition. You're going to write dialogue. Doesn't matter your genre. It doesn't matter your book. Doesn't matter if it's young adult or adult or whatever else. You're going to run into exposition and dialogue. They're kind of requirements for story. Here, though, I want, to, I want to swim out into deeper waters, get you away from being able to touch the bottom and feeling maybe a little bit, oh, a little bit unsure. Not in a bad way, but I want to get you to think. So let's go deeper. Let's talk about internals. Now, internals, they're what a character is thinking, period, thinking. Sometimes they're going to be overt. Character has this thought. Sometimes they're not going to be overt. And you're going to talk about it generally. They're a kind of narrative. They're one of the only kinds of narratives that we often indicate by changing topography. We use italics. Now, just so we're clear, you do not always 100% have to use italics. You can. It's an option, just like any of the other stuff we've talked about. It's a choice. However, once you start doing it, you got to stick with it all the way through. You've committed to a choice, roll with it. And just so we're clear, not all thoughts need to be italicized. Sometimes, depending on how we're writing it, we're going to use italics. And then if we do that, then we italicize all the thoughts. As long as we're not in first person, there are exceptions to our rules. But by and large, once you commit to changing your typography, you're going to change it all the way through. This is just thinking. The trick to developing what a character is thinking is you thinking it. Be the character. Sit there in that moment. Now, that might be difficult. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to make it more difficult. I'm trying to point out, though, that this is hard. We're in deeper water. 
A character is always thinking something. Always. Just like you, listening to this, watching this, you're always thinking something. I don't know what those thoughts are. I don't need to know the depth of all those thoughts. It's fine. But you're always thinking something. However, it's worth pointing out that not all those thoughts are worth sharing. Sometimes you're thinking about how, you know, God, I really wish I had another cup of coffee or I wish my work day was done or, you know, I'm hungry or there's this or there's that. Not all thoughts need to be communicated to the reader. They just don't. Nor does this mean you should only communicate the most critical plot stuff because that's what the story's about. Again, it's about creating context and developing a bridge between character and reader. But some thoughts, they don't need to share. But there is always something. Remember how we talked about dialogue as a reaction? You can make an argument that an internal, a thought, is uncommunicated dialogue. So there's always something, an idea, an action, a feeling, something, that is prompting a character to have that thought. It's up to you to figure out, okay, so here's the character. They're in this situation. What are they thinking? Sometimes we're going to communicate that by describing their thoughts, writing sentences that talk about their thoughts. Other times we're going to have them do it with dialogue. Other times we're going to have them do it just with action. But there's always something, there's always some prompt, some cue, some thing that kicks it off. Find those in those scenes and in those moments, and your ability to communicate what a character is thinking will improve dramatically. I promise. When your character is thinking whatever it is they're thinking, it makes that character feel more substantial. Because if you just deal with talking, character says this, then they use this superpower. Character does this, then this happens. And we don't really get into their heads. The characters feel flat. They don't feel as well developed as they could be. Because we don't have access to a significant part of who they are. Think about it this way. If you wanted to get to know someone, if you wanted to feel connected, I, whether you take that in whatever direction you want, doesn't matter. But if you really wanted to get to know somebody and really feel like I, I get them, I, I see who they are, I know what they're about, you would need some kind of access to what they're thinking. Maybe you'd ask, hey, what are you thinking right now? Or you'd ask questions. What do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? But you'd have some way of getting thoughts. It wouldn't just be, I see what they do and I hear what they say. You need this other dimension. When you deny that to the reader, you make it hard for them to go, oh, I get this character. I can get on board with this character. Or more concretely, I want to keep reading this character. Your reader wants to understand what the character is thinking and feeling and why they're doing what they're doing. The how of what they're doing, well, that's just description. That's just word choice. That's just sentence structure. I'm, you know, pulling wires out of the bomb to diffuse it. I'm chopping the vegetables with a knife because I'm cooking. That's just description. That doesn't necessarily communicate the why underneath it. And if we just summarize it to, I'm making dinner. Okay, okay that's an action. Emotions and internals allow us to dig in and give this action of, I'm making dinner to give it more weight, to give it more substance. And that really matters. Because when you provide substance to a reader, they care more. They see it as a challenge. They see it as a risk. They see it as important. And they root for the character to succeed. It isn't just about, you know, that transcript we talked about with dialogue. It's not about just saying, then I did this, then I did this, then this happened, then that happened. It's not rigid like that. One more point, and then we'll do an example. You don't have to confuse knowing everything with understanding a character. Lots of people, when they sit down and they start writing, they get in this mode, they get in this frame of thinking that they have to communicate everything. Maybe literally, maybe not, maybe a little bit of yes and a little bit of no. But they absolutely think that if they don't explain every inch of everything, if they don't make clear all the whatever the reader's not going to know what's happening. What that means and what that suggests is the reader thinks, or sorry, the writer thinks that the reader is stupid. And the writer thinks the reader needs them to explain it to them. You know the sort of humans we do that with? Children. 
your do you do you want to treat your reader like a child? Do you want to just you know condescending? I mean, on the extreme, in the worst case, you're condescending. Do you really want to establish that kind of rapport with your reader? You want this person to buy multiple books, right? You really want to talk to them that way? You think that's really going to encourage them to keep reading your stuff if it always, you know, you sit there and spoon feed them everything? The reader is looking for an experience with your book. They're looking to be entertained. They're looking to be engaged. They want that movie. They don't want it stopped and explained, okay, here's what this scene does. Remember the big glowy dagger? It's going to be important in 10 pages. Pay attention to the dagger. Like, they're not dumb. You don't have to treat them that way. You don't have to spell everything out. Understanding the character and understanding the present moment is not the same as knowing everything. You can withhold information, you know, whether that's big deal information like, oh my God, that's really the killer or small information. I didn't know they were wearing tennis shoes until just now. You don't have to know everything in order to understand. You, you've watched a movie at some point in your life. Yes then you've run into the situation of you you're you're in this movie has grabbed your attention this television show whatever it is you've watched stuff and you didn't know everything you didn't know how it was going to end in the next episode you didn't know what was coming next but you stayed watching because you understood what was going on up to that point and then you kept watching and then it moved the point the amount of stuff you understood moves forward as you move forward through story and that's true for you watching whatever or you reading whatever. And it's true for the reader. It doesn't suddenly change just because it's not your experience. Don't confuse understanding with knowing or needing to know everything. You're not going to give your reader a quiz. You're not going to test them on what was the name of the cat? Like, that's not a thing that's going to happen. Don't belabor it. Don't, you know, drown them in fact. Give them an experience. Put that movie in their heads. On we go. So here's our example. It was awesome. Not awesome in the way dresses with pockets are awesome. Awesome like she was filled with awe. The kind of awe she only read about. The kind of awe she thought reserved for gods. The kind of awe she stopped believing in years ago when Doug broke her heart. But here, right now, there were actual ghosts and elves walking through her house. She was awake. They were right in front of her. And it was awesome. Holy shit, she whispered. This is not what I expected. Now, I couldn't do italics with the font I chose for the slide, so I made the what would be the italicized thought. I made it blue on the background so it stood out. Typographic choice. But in this example, in this setup, you, the writer, want to say, okay, here's the scene I have to write. This is going to happen. This is, this is the thing. You should know what that is because you wrote an outline, because you know what's coming next. You've sat down and thought it out. You get into that moment where you're ready to write the next chapter, the next scene, the next two pages, the next whatever. The character is thinking something. Figure out why. What's doing the prompting? What's leading this person to have this thought? And how much space on the page? How many sentences? One sentence, five sentences, 10 pages? How much space am I going to dedicate? And that answer is entirely up to you. How much space am I going to dedicate to developing the clarity as to why the character is having the thought they're having? And then to follow that up, how much space am I going to dedicate to the thought the character has after I've established the why or the prompt for it? So in our example, we spend a lot of time talking about how it feels. It was awesome. There's this big kind of awe. It's a big deal. But the exact why, what's prompting this awe is pretty short. It's one sentence. It's not even a one sentence. It's most of a sentence. There were actual ghosts and elves walking through our house. That's the thing prompting this thought. The paragraph prior sets up the how this thought should be considered. And then the last part of our example holy shit, she whispered, this is not what I expected, is a reaction. Because dialogue is a reaction to what's going on in the moment. And the thought is a continuation of that reaction. Not all reaction needs to be made verbal, but it does need to exist if I'm trying to sell to the reader this idea about how it should feel. The clearer you can make this prompting, and I, I don't mean... 
I, I do not want you, I'll be real clear. I do not want you to spend paragraphs and pages laying out what's prompting the thought. You don't have to, again, we don't have to bludgeon the reader with all the details, but we have an opportunity to get the reader to agree with the character because the reader is going to ask this question whenever the character is thinking stuff. If I, the reader, were in this situation, remember, they want to be a voyeur. They want to be in the scene with the character. If I, the reader, were in the situation, knowing at this moment what the character knows, doing at this moment what the character does, would I agree with how the character is feeling? Would I agree? Is this, in fact, for the reader, a holy shit moment the way it is for this character? Ideally, we want to make it that way. We want to get those two things to sync up because that way the reader's like, oh, this story is really good. I get it. I feel it. They might never have been in a house where ghosts and elves walk through. That might not be a thing in the reader's experience. But if I can convey to that reader, this thing is this kind of awesome. I can try and find ways of connecting to other similar awesome experiences the reader has, which is why there's part of a sentence that says, the way dresses with pockets are awesome because I'm hoping my reader has been in that situation where they're like, Oh my God, this dress has pockets and take that feeling, which is concrete for them and bring it over into my made up story and show that those two things are more or less the same. You know, it's not dresses with pockets in my fiction, but it's the same vibe. It's the same amount of feeling. You need to get into the habit when you're developing what a character is thinking and feeling, you need to get in the habit of asking if the reader was in this position, would they agree with this thought? Far too often, one of the big editorial red flags is that when a character has thoughts, they're only having thoughts because the plot needs them to think about it. I need to solve this murder. Yeah, you do. Obviously you do. It's a detective story. I need to tell him how much I feel about him. Yeah, it's a romance novel. That's kind of a given. We can't really do the romance novel without you finding out that you're in love with this guy. You don't want to be elementary. You don't want to go too far. You don't want to overspell it. But you do want to make the emotional landscape of the character, what they're thinking, what they're feeling in this moment, you want to make it as clear as possible. So that the reader goes, oh, I get it. This is why they feel that way. Cool. And how are they reacting? Okay, they feel this way. Neat. I would do the same thing. Great. Nailed it. Move on. Straightforward. It can be, I know I'm making that sound simple, but it can be that straightforward. It doesn't need to be this sort of lengthy thing where the reader has to guess, or if we wait 10 pages from now, like I guess, you know, you'll, you'll tell them later. Tell them in the moment because the reader and the character are only ever in the moment together. With me so far, are we doing good? I got to get a mouthful of water. Otherwise, I'm going to start coughing. Are we good? Because we're going to go on now. Deeper water ahead. And we're going to get into scene development. Are we good? This is a lot. I know it's a lot. This is going to be one of those things you stop and go through a couple times. I know. It's by design. It's how I do things best. So here we are. At scene development, the fourth of our five depths, the fourth of our five scene considerations. Scene development, I spend a lot of time with individual writers on this, whether it's in a writing group or a coaching session or whatever. Scene development is the thing I love doing the most, most out of all the things. Because if you get really good at developing what your scenes are, everything else suddenly has like a place. Oh, this is where I can put the talking. Oh, this is where I can put the action. It, it makes for effective structure. Scene development has lots of ability, lots of utility. That's a word we're going to use a couple times. Scene development, I think, is the most critical skill for most people because you know what you mean when you write a sentence, when you write a paragraph, when you set a scene up, you know what you mean. But now we got to get that idea in the reader's head. And here's how. So scene development is all the words of all different kinds that help the reader navigate what they should picture, how they should feel. 
It's the exposition. It's the stuff that makes a scene a scene. We're going to break this into some pieces and we'll, we'll get into this way more with the example, but this is how we tie the exposition discussion we had with some descriptive stuff along with the impressionistic stuff so that we have space for that emotional stuff we just talked about before. I'm going to make you a better scene writer in like five steps. I don't care what book you're writing. I don't care what draft it is. I can make you a better scene developer. And here's how we're going to do it. Just remember your job is to put a movie in the reader's head. If we start there, this is going to get a lot easier for you. Here we go. Sentences are cameras. This sentence you're writing, whatever sentence it is, has to put some part of a movie in the reader's head. Is this sentence you're writing, putting a visual in their head? Is it helping establish a mood? Is it connecting some dots? Some, is it bringing up stuff you already mentioned? Is it dialogue? Is it sound? Is it a weather description? Are we talking about the number of birds to picture in the sky? Every sentence is a camera. It's doing something to contribute to this movie. You, if you want to improve your scenes like a thousand percent very quickly, start thinking about what is this sentence doing? Why is this sentence here? Why is this sentence in the spot that it is on the page or in the paragraph? Sentences are cameras. They're filming something, which means they also should not be choppy. Remember, we talked about early on how it shouldn't just be like a little kid reading a nervous book report in front of the class where it's just this sentence, then there's this sentence, and then there's this sentence. And it's very unsmooth and very stiff. Our cameras move. We can pick them up. We can float them. We can turn them upside down. We can zoom in. We can zoom out. Every sentence is contributing something to the movie in the reader's brain. And the amount of movement they do is entirely up to you. And it can be irregular. You can go from an incredible close-up, so close you can see up the character's nose and into their brain and their neurons firing all the way out to the moon if you wanted to. You could move that camera as much as you want, as fast as you want, as far as you want. You just have to make sure that the movie makes sense, that the reader can follow you. A scene is always moving forward. Now I say that and some people freak the fuck out about pacing. You don't need to. I'm not saying that. The goal is not to constantly speed up and be conscious of it. Oh my God, I'm moving at five miles an hour. I have to go to 10. I have to go to 15. We're not shifting gears in a car. You don't have to hit a certain RPM, then pop the clutch, drop the gear shift. You don't have to do any of that. The scene's always moving forward because the reader's eyes are always moving across and down the page. You can make them go faster. You can make them go slower. That's fine. It's not a contest, but the scene is always moving. You don't need to over-engineer these sentences and make sure that there's like an appropriate speed limit. You have to read this at metaphoric 35 miles an hour, nothing faster. Nah, that's not a thing. Don't do that. That's not helping. Put a movie in the reader's head. Now, I know there's also like a tech bro vibe that it's just better somehow if you consume your media at like 1.5 or two times the speed, because that way you're more free to crush it, bro, or something, which is ridiculous. You take as much time as you want to take. You can have as many sentences about a thing as you want to have. You can, you could spend five paragraphs on the fruit salad at a church social if you want it. Go ahead. Who's going to stop you? It's your book. Some people get real fussy when I say that. And, oh, well, publishing says it's good. I don't give a shit. You want to spend a chapter talking about how a character feels laying in bed when their alarm's going off, they don't want to go to work? You spend as much time as you want. Because what matters is that every sentence is doing something and cooperating with the sentences around it to put that movie in the reader's head. Scenes are mini movies inside the big movie of your story. So if that's the case, and that's how we want to set this up, every scene is going to have some stuff in it. 
Here are the requirements for scenes. And I don't have a slide for this, so you're just going to have to count on your fingers along with me. One, every character in every scene, I don't care who they are, they have a goal, whether it's the, just the person who's pumping gas in the car or it's the lady in line at the bank or it's the main character who's got to go do a thing or the bad guy who's got to rob the bank or whatever. Every character in a scene has a goal. Sometimes that goal is a big deal. Sometimes that goal is a little deal. Whatever. They've got a goal. If you can't identify what a character's goal in a scene is, you've got a real question as to why that character is in this scene. Give them something to do or GTFO. Second thing, every scene takes place somewhere. There's a location. Now, that location can change. We can go from inside the car to inside the office, or we can go up the elevator to a floor or something, or we can navigate different parts of our spaceship. But there's always a location. Nothing happens in the middle of nowhere. Even if we say it's happening in the vacuum of space, it's happening somewhere. All scenes have locations, at least one. Maybe it's just one, but there's always a location. And that location is going to place constraints on the scene. If we know that at this scene takes place in the elevator on the way to the office, we know that this scene does not, for instance, take place on Mars or underwater or, you know, intimately in, in the bedroom of the main character. Those constraints create a sense of boundary and a sense of border for the scene, limiting it so that we focus on what's inside as opposed to not. We don't, so, so for instance, I'm currently sitting in my office in the house talking into a microphone. I am at my address. My address is in a house on a street in a, in a place with a zip code. There are other towns next to it. It's part of a County, et cetera, et cetera. While I'm here doing this, talking to you, none of us randomly are thinking about the middle of the wilderness in Alaska right now. We're just not. There are boundaries and constraints that are keeping us focused. Scenes benefit from that. Next thing a scene always has. A scene has a challenge or a conflict collectively in it. Everybody's in this elevator trying to get to the office. The traffic is there to get everybody out of the city and back to their homes. People are just trying to like go to the bank. There's a collective challenge in front of all the characters. And that challenge is sometimes related to their overall goal. The kid pouring coffee at Starbucks is just trying to pour this cup of coffee and get one step closer to being done for the day. But there's a challenge for every character in a scene. Maybe it's goal related. Maybe it's not. Maybe there are multiple goals. We have to, you know, fight these bandits so we can continue on the road to move forward in our fantasy quest. Okay, cool. There's always a challenge that somebody or some, multiple somebodies is trying to overcome. And because there's a challenge in that location, there are two more factors. There is an estimation made by the people in the scene as to how hard or easy that goal is going to be. For instance, the kid who has poured 500 cups of coffee is not probably thinking that Pouring coffee cup number 502, not terribly difficult. There's an estimation of how easy or hard it's going to be based on what that character is experiencing in the moment. Everything's fine until the telekinetic comes in the room and makes the coffee pots float. But normally, under normal circumstances, characters have a rough idea of how hard or easy something should be. It influences their decisions. If I think talking to you is not a course or a reason to be incredibly anxious, it changes the way I communicate with you. It changes my tone. It changes the way I, my, I sit, my posture. It changes my word choice. If I suddenly think, oh my God, there's seven people watching this. I will sit up in my chair. I will readjust the microphone. I will start thinking about who those seven people could be and where they're all at individually. And if I know any of them and if any of them have, like know me and know me well, so maybe they're rooting for me or, or, or wanting me to fail or something. And I'll get all up in my head and it will change the way I do things. 
think about the challenges faced by characters in your scenes. Sometimes those challenges are going to be related to your goals. Sometimes they're not going to be related to your goals. But those characters are going to have a sense, a guess, an unknown quantity about doing something about those challenges. Should be easy to do. Should be hard to do. Even if they don't know specifically, I don't know how hard it's going to be, still suggests it's going to be a little bit hard. And then the last thing every scene has is the reality of it. Here's how hard it actually is. Strip away the character's thought, strip away their fear, strip away their estimation, and look just at the practicality of pouring that cup of coffee. Well, as long as his hand stays attached to his wrist, as long as he maintains muscle tension and you know doesn't have an aneurysm and die on the floor, the coffee pot doesn't start floating, there is an actual reality to how hard pouring a cup of coffee for that kid is. Or me talking to you about a thing I've talked about a million times. The tension, remember we talked about tension earlier when we were talking about exposition? The tension here is the distance between how hard it really is and how hard or easy I think it is. Because if that tension, is, if there's a big gap, and I think something is way hard when it is in fact pretty easy, I'm going to over-engineer the shit out of it because I'm nervous. And that's going to change the way I act in the scene. Likewise, the flip side is also true. If I think something is super easy, and it instead turns out to be really difficult, I'm going to have to scramble because I will go from like, ah, it's no big deal to, oh God, it's a huge deal. And that's going to change the way I, the character in the scene, act. What I haven't talked about so far are the very concrete things of like, when do I talk about the weather? How do I talk about the trees? What's up with the rain? Because those elements of scene development are not as critical as you might think. Yes, it's important to you because you're trying to get, you know, the picture out of your head into the reader's head. But let's roll back half a step. There's no quiz. There's no test. The story doesn't come to a screeching halt if the reader doesn't remember that on page 49 it was lightly raining. Getting too focused on the descriptive specifics. Here's the rain. Here are the trees. Here are the blades of grass. Bogs the reader down because the more you talk about a thing, anything, the more important the reader is going to assume it is. Now, that doesn't mean you need to skip everything, and it doesn't mean you need to focus only on the plot, but it does mean you don't need to make everything a big goddamn deal because when everything is important, Nothing feels important because it's all, oh my God, a priority screaming in our faces. Your scene development is just moving that camera one thing at a time. Here's an idea. Put it down. Connect it to this next idea. Put it down. Go to the next idea. Now I got three ideas. Here's how they feel. Here's what they are. Whether we're talking about the rain, the trees, the grass, the birds, the time of day, the noble quest of our hero, whatever. Camera, 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 focus, move, focus, move, focus, move. On we go. So the big takeaway whenever we're writing a scene is take your time. Take your time. Write more words. It is almost always, especially in a first draft, almost always a better idea to overwrite everything. Not trying to forcibly explain everything. No one gives a shit where every nail and bolt and screw is. But if you need to take your time to move the reader through the scene because every sentence is a camera, then take your time. You can always trim it back. We can always cut it down. It's a lot easier to cut what's there and trim it back than have to invent stuff to fill a specific space later. So let's look at our example. It was a good day for a block party, though they didn't technically call it a block party since that would require getting a permit. 
It was instead called a multi-home yard project, even though no yards did anything other than hold folding chairs and oversee kids running around. Everyone was there, from Ted Jenkins at the top of the hill all the way down the street to Wanda and Pat Southern, who just finished moving in the week before. All of them were having a good time now, with drinks poured and burgers grilled. A good day for a block party would surely lead to a good night for ritual sacrifice. The unspeakable one be praised. That's a scene. Well, it's not a whole scene. It's a part of a development for a scene. Now, what did I do there that works? Well, there's no magic number of details. I talked about burgers. I talked about drinks. I talked about chairs. I talked about kids. I talked about yards. I, there's a hill somewhere on this street. Are there specifics? Did we talk about the color and painting of houses or where the cars are parked? No. Could I do that in the next paragraph? Sure. Could I have done that here? Yeah. But every sentence is a camera. And right now, right here on this page, that's what I wanted to show you. A good day for a block party. Okay, what does that make you think of? That's impressionistic. It's not descriptive. Probably a weather thing, time of day thing, seasonal. I left that picture up to you. I'm trusting you, the reader, to fill that in. Now, maybe later in another paragraph, I will qualify that. I'll say more about it. But for now, hey, you handle that part. And then we move forward. Okay, they didn't call it a party because that would require a permit. There's a little bit of world building exposition. What does it mean for you to know that now? Well, that tells us something about how they want to organize this party. It tells us something, however subtly, about the people involved. They didn't want to get a permit. That speaks to a certain kind of person. Okay, they called it a multi-home yard project. Great, that just sounds bureaucratic. Even though no yards did anything other than hold folding chairs. How many folding chairs? What color? Where were they? No, doesn't matter. Maybe I'll fill that in later. And oversee kids running around. Now, arguably, oversee is an editorial stretch because lawns don't, yards don't have eyes. But I think you'll give me a little bit of artistic license. I'm painting a picture. My sentence is a camera. Kids are running around. How many kids? Well, I don't know. But kids running around would go back to this idea of good idea. I'm tying pieces together. Notice I didn't get specific, though. I didn't say there's exactly six kids and one of them is named Joe. Doesn't matter. I can do that later. But every scene is a collection of sentences, a collection of cameras, a selection of things putting a movie in your head. Part of that movie is your responsibility. You're filling in these gaps that I leave you. Part of it is my responsibility. When I need to get specific, I get specific. We're in this together. We're co-creating my scene. That's a nuancey kind of idea, but it's a really useful one for getting you to stop being so rigid about how you write whatever you write or how you are too brief because you're holding on too tightly and too rigidly. We're in this together. Take your time. Each detail does not need to live in its own sentence. I could have had a separate sentence about the chairs. I could have had a separate sentence about the kids running around or the drinks or the burgers or Wanda and Pat Southern or Ted Jenkins or the Hill. I could have parked all those things in sentences and we could have had 10 slides of details. I didn't. Why didn't I? It didn't matter to me. It's an example. But if we take this as part of the scene, knowing that there will be other paragraphs because I'm taking my time, We can start to identify and look for goals, locations, stuff like that. So let's start from the top. All scenes involve characters. Do we have characters? Yes. I got kids. I got Ted Jenkins. I got Wanda and Pat Southern. I got people. I got a they. People, great. Location. Well, there's a block. It's got yards. It seems like a neighborhood. I don't use that word right away, but it seems that way. Okay, I have locations. Now, there are goals. Okay, do we have any specifics? Well, at some point, there were drinks to pour and burgers to grill, so those goals were accomplished. And a good day for a block party should lead to a good night for ritual sacrifice. So that's a goal. Somebody's getting ritually sacrificed. Great. How hard or easy do the characters perceive that to be? 
Well, there's a speculative sentence. A good day would surely lead to a good night. So there's kind of an implication that just based on this, just based on the abstract without extra detail, there's a sense it could be okay. We don't know. We'll have to keep reading. We'll have to get more detail. And that's really what we want the reader to do. Just keep getting more detail. That's why we don't need to park everything in its own individual sentence. It's why we don't need to detail every single blade of grass or every single tree or the backstory of every board on a house. You can move in a combination of description and impressionistic writing. Every sentence is a camera. There is no magic number of details. There is no right number or wrong number per paragraph. Every writer, no matter who you are, no matter what you're writing, no matter where you're at, has a certain way you construct sentences. It is part of your authorial voice. It's just how you communicate. That's not wrong. It's not bad. We want that. We want to praise and develop and strengthen how you communicate. We want to make you a better writer. So we're going to, we're going to make sure that authorial and narrative voice, authorial voice is how you sound. Narrative voice is how the story comes across. We want to make those two voices the biggest deal possible because that's how we communicate the story. So you've got a natural way you communicate. This is how you sound when you write. You're going to average a certain number of words on your sentences. Typically, you're going to use this many commas. You're going to use this word so many times. It's just part of writing. There are no magic numbers. It doesn't need to be like you use so this many times and you're only allowed this many commas. Doesn't work like that. Never going to work like that. We're not making widgets at the widget factory. We want to find out, okay, John tends to write sentences that are this long. How do we make this work for when we need to, you know, develop this kind of scene or that kind of scene. Oh, um, I know Tim is in chat. Tim uses this many commas. So what does that say about how Tim wants to write this thing or that thing? These aren't negatives. I know there's a lot of editorial social media discussion about how you have to have this much of this or not enough of that or whatever. It, it doesn't need to work that way. There are no hard and fast rules. The most critical thing, and honestly, if you're somebody who's out there looking for traditional publishing, you've heard this before. The thing everybody's looking for is strong writing and strong voice. How you get there is not math. This is not a recipe. You have to have this many cups and this many tablespoons. How you get there is by making sure that your authorial voice, how you communicate, and your narrative voice, how you specifically communicate the story, are prioritized and working together naturally. It sounds like you communicating. You've picked a, a style, a way of writing, and you stuck with it the whole time. Take your time. Nobody is expecting you, especially if you're in your first draft on your first book, nobody is expecting you to get this immediately down right away the first time. And no one is saying you have to nail it once, carve it in stone, and never change it. This is a thing that evolves like a Pokemon. It just grows and moves and shifts over time. Because you grow and shift and move over time, you're a human. Take your time. You don't have to rush. We don't have to be in a hurry. Just every sentence is a camera adding something to the movie. On we go. You ready for the deep end? Ready for the, wow, 90 minutes. Ready for the real heavy stuff? I can't say heavy. I don't, I don't want to make it sound super complicated. This isn't like calculus or something. It's just a different level of thinking about all the stuff that we have going on in our stories. So what I want you to do for this section is think about the thing you're writing or the thing you're planning on writing or the thing you've been stuck on writing or the whatever it is you've got cooking, wherever you're at, the beginning, the middle, the end, the climax, that chapter, this scene, whatever. Get it in your head. Picture it. Spin it around because we're going to talk about it in a lot of different ways, bringing together all our pieces, but adding one more layer to it. And that layer is reactions. Here we go. Reactions are all about the expression of interaction between things. This happens, so that happens as a response. This gets mentioned, so that happens as a response. Because you say it like this, you've got to set it up for that. 
reactions are the engine that drives story. I'm not just talking about plot, though that is a kind of reaction. I'm not talking about world building, though that is a set of reactions. It's everything. It's a whole spooling together of ideas and a whole way of framing and understanding that when you write X, Y, Z in a sentence, whatever it might be, you are setting up potential reactions for the next ABC thing you wrote in the next sentence. It's the engagement in the way these two sentences cooperate or press against each other or contrast one another. Reactions are the words dedicated to the expressing of how something responds to something else. Now, maybe those two somethings are two people in a conversation. Maybe it's a person and the situation they're in. Maybe it's, you know, two physical objects with no people whatsoever. Reaction are just how things relate to one another in space. Your story, particularly your characters, develop that sense of relatability and believability when their reactions and interactions feel most natural. When we talk about tension, right? So we have that, like the ticking clock with a bomb or the gauge in the machinery as it slowly moves from green to yellow to red, the danger zone. Those are all reactions that are prompting us to feel something. Reactions are critical. You don't have to come running out of the gate on the first page in the opening scene, immediately sweating reactions. This is, this is down the road sort of stuff. But you do have to understand that in every scene, anything that you dedicate a sentence to has the potential to react to the next sentence or the sentence before it, or you're setting up something that'll react five sentences from now. It all meshes together, blends together, bleeds together, spills over and tangles up. Reactions make story messy, but in that messiness, we find a sense of believability, for lack of a better word. This is the engine that drives story, how one thing reacts or interacts with something else. Reactions affect tension. We talked about tension earlier. Reaction affects tension in all different kinds. Think about this in terms of the relationship, not just between people, though that is a relationship you should always poke a stick at, but the relationship of X to Y, no matter what they are. So there are five questions we can ask. How does X, whatever X is, a thing we just wrote a sentence about, respond to Y, something else we have a sentence about? Maybe it's the same sentence. Maybe it's a sentence apart. Maybe they're in two different paragraphs. Doesn't really matter. But how does this thing, this element of story we're going to call X, how does it respond to this other element of story we're going to call Y? What does X expect Y to do? I turn a light switch on. What happens? The lamps go on. There's an expectation there. Whether that expectation matches that response that's great. And it's no big deal because maybe we're writing sentences about how there are kids in the yard, you know, playing around during the multi-house yard party thing, because we're going to kill somebody in the ritual sacrifice later. Maybe it's inconsequential and it's not that big a deal, but this is one of those ways we can spotlight and pick and choose something big, small, the asteroid in our space story, the, the, lack of rum in our pirate story, the complicated relationship between the two people and the will they, won't they fall in love moment. There are always these different things we can affect and change and shift so that we have tension or we build tension or that we reduce tension to give our story a sense of grounded functionality. Your reactions and interactions happen all over the place. You don't have to map all of them. Remember when we talked about dialogue, how we talked about it, it wasn't a transcript. We weren't trying to get 100% of everything down exactly the way that it is because we're not looking to Xerox your brain. We're just looking to relate to somebody else. Reactions are like that too. We don't need to document everything. We pick and choose the ones we want to focus on. Sure, you might mention two or three small ones, the little kid running across the yard, the, the fan blowing air in the room. And that's nice, but <coughs> excuse me. But in the long term, 
it's more important that we focus on something else. You get to pick and choose what reactions you highlight out of all the reactions and interactions you mention. So let's go back to our questions. How does X respond to Y? What does X expect Y to do? And this is, you can flip these around too. How does Y respond to X? It's the same thing. There's also another side of this. What doesn't X want Y to do? There's something there that X does not want to have happen. There's an expectation of I turn the light switch on, the lamp goes on. That's the expected response. The light switch, for instance, probably does not want to burn and melt. I'm personifying it for the sake of our example, but there's probably a want on some quantum level to not burn my house down. So X doesn't want Y to do something. What is it? Maybe if we dig a little deeper, we could also get into a position of, is there something that Y won't do or X won't do or Q won't do? I turn my light, you know, I, I turn this light on, the lamp goes on. It's going to just do that. It is not going to suddenly send, you know, throngs of people running through my door telling me how brilliant I am. It is not going to suddenly magically produce a sandwich for me. There are things that other elements in your story won't do, and there are things that it will do. And then we get our last question, which might be the most critical for me. I'm not entirely sure. What choices in this moment, in this scene, can X and Y make? Now, maybe it's nothing. Maybe we're talking about the lawn and the trees and the sun and the sky. There's not really a whole lot of choice there because we're just setting things up. And if that's the case, that's fine. Move to the next thing. Keep the camera moving. Continue to tell the story. But when we turn X and Y into Pat and Wanda Southern, who have gone to this party and just realized that these people all seem a little bit weird and culty, now X and Y have choices because of the context, because of the moment, because of the tension they feel. There are always tensions between people, objects, opportunity, and emotion in a scene. The stuff, the physical stuff, the real world stuff, but also the stuff they think and the stuff they feel, as well as the chances they have. There's always tension. It's not always, you know, 1980s Cold War nuclear death tension. It's not always at any minute the wizard could strike and curse the land tension. Sometimes it's just the unease a character feels going into a new situation. Sometimes it's just no tension of just the, the sun is shining and everybody's happy. Sometimes it's a lot of tension. It's a little tension. Your ability to think about that tension and grade it, understand it, feel it, and then figure out how to express it is what makes this more substantial. It's what gives reactions the, the power they have to help add depth and dimension to a story so that we're not just reading that story about the knight goes over there and gets a sword and then grabs the rogue and the wizard and the priest and they go down in the dungeon to fight the dragon. It doesn't just need to be this recitation of actions that made up people do in a made up space. We're trying to do better than that. We're trying to do more than that. So. We do that by thinking about their reactions and their reactive potential. Let's look at an example. And there he was in front of her, the Baron, the man responsible for the murder of Penelope and the burning of the farm, the man who sent the ruffians to the orphanage, the man who claimed the lands that stretched from the forest to the river. He stood there frozen, eyes locked on her sword and pistol. He didn't even have time to stand up. She wanted to shoot him where he sat, shoot him and let his blood spill across the desk, shoot him and reload and keep shooting him until the bastard of the valley was little more than a pulpy mess on the floor. She moved to her left. The Baron went right. She thought she saw him smile. That section of text, two paragraphs, is packed with reactions. It's not just, ah, I'm reacting happy to a birthday surprise. It's not always that big. It's small stuff. It's not just limited to people either. It's the sight. It's the sound. It's the opportunity. It's the movements. I go this way. They go that way. I indicate. I lean. I, I threaten. I escalate. They de-escalate. It's always reacting to something. I'm doing a thing and there's always something somewhere in the scene reacting and changing what they're doing because I did a thing. I did this, the little green bar that measures my volume moves. 
I say a thing and you go, oh, I get it. That's cool. And you write it down or you make a note or you say, John, I'm in way over my head. I need to give this up. Let me go check the replay out in an hour from now after my brain cools off. Things are always reacting and interacting with each other. All things. Now, some things won't immediately interact with each other. Right now, the sun is shining out my window. And I don't have a direct reaction for that because I'm talking to you. But if I look over here, there's the cat laying in the sun. Okay, cool. Cat's laying in the sun. Neat. My reaction to that is it reduces my blood pressure and I don't have to worry. Hey, I haven't heard from the cat in a while. I can focus on what I'm reading. Think about reaction. Think about the interaction between things. Not everything is explicit. Not everything is simple. Not everything needs to be as short as possible. A reacts to B. Baking soda and vinegar makes a volcano. Not everything needs to be like that. But anything should be able to have some kind of reaction, even if that reaction is zero, to anything else. The sun, the sun shining out my window right now does not care about the fantasy novel you're writing. There's no reaction there. But you writing may be motivated to write because it's nice outside. You're not feeling so blah. You're not feeling so run down. There's an interaction there. In all these interactions, for all these different things, your job is to not try so hard to overthink it and express it in exactly the right, I'm making air quotes, the right words. Because it's, it's not like that. Again, not a transcript. Never going to be a transcript. Your job in these moments where you're thinking about the interaction and the reaction and how this guy's going to drive down the street or how this lady's going to cast a spell or whatever. Think about how it feels to the reader because the reader is trying to be the character in the moment. In our example, where, you know, the Baron is standing in front of our woman with sword and pistol, the reader wants to be her. The reader wants to be somebody who's got the sword and the pistol and they're staring down their hated enemy responsible for the murder of Penelope and the burning of the farm. The reader wants to be them. Not in a literal exact sort of way, but they want to feel that feeling. They want to be like, yeah, fuck yeah, I've got my bad guy cornered. What's going to happen? Ah, that's awesome. That's what the reader wants to feel. You can give them some of that feeling. They have to fill in the rest. Remember, you're co-creating this experience with them. They're not only coming to you just for recitation. They're not sitting crisscross applesauce on their carpet square while you read at their faces. You're in this together. Interactions are in this together. Your dialogue, your exposition, working together, your scene development, all that stuff is coming together. And the big challenge here is to get you, the writer, to think through all your scenes. Okay, I'm going to write this sentence. How should it feel? What should the reader picture in their head? What should they hear? What should they know? And then we move forward over and over and over again. So the question in chat is, so reactions come from characters caring about what they're trying to achieve in scenes. Yes, reactions do come from characters caring about what they're trying to achieve in scenes. Reactions come from more things, but characters trying to achieve their goals is a reaction and an interaction. Yes. Next part. Is it modified by the sense of challenge versus the reality? Yes. If I, again, go back to our previous part where I talk about how hard or easy I think it is, I'm going to act and behave a certain way. I think this is easy. I'm not going to try very hard. That's going to be, you know, that's going to have an interaction with what's going on. If I half-ass something, well, I got to live with the consequences. If I over-engineer it, I, I, I run the risk of being anxious and nervous. I got to deal with those consequences too. Yes. That dynamic between the sense or estimation of challenge and the reality helps steer and guide a character's reaction. I think something is hard. I think something is easy. So I act this way or I do this thing. Whereas if I thought it were different, I would do something differently because I'm trying to accomplish my goal as a character. The skill I use to accomplish this goal, B, 
based on my estimation of how hard or easy it is, is further tempered by what kind of person I am as a character. Am I a good guy that you know behaves a certain way? Am I a bad guy willing to do anything? And then it's further affected by what's around me in the scene. If I'm in a room with you and we're having an argument, I might get frustrated and want to throw something at you. But if there's nothing for me to throw at you, my choices of actions are limited. Reactions drive characters. Characters further have more interactions, which lead to more reactions over and over and over again. That's a great question. Thanks for asking it. Oh. Shall we keep going? Because we're just about done. So let me ask you, are there any questions? Because we're ready to get out of here. In an hour and 45 minutes, we have covered a lot of ground. Any questions? Yes, this was a lot. I know this was a lot. The big takeaways. Let's do some recap. Big takeaways. Exposition is all the stuff that is not a character talking and is not a character thinking. Done. Exposition's job is to be the stuff that the camera shows us on a per sentence level. As we write each sentence, we're going to ask, what should the reader see, hear, think, feel, know? as they read this sentence and then we go to the next sentence and they keep asking those questions and each sentence should in some way connect or relate to the stuff before it. There's a great question in chat. What do you think takes a scene from good to great impact on readers? I love that question. I think the biggest, the most critical part of going from good to great is how the reader can relate to the choices the characters make in a scene. I think a great scene is when a reader is able to read it and go, I understand what the characters are feeling. I understand why they're doing what they're doing, why they're saying what they're saying or why they're thinking what they're thinking. It really resonates. It's not just a matter of understanding. Like I see all the words on the page and I know what each of them mean. I think it's about the reader being able to empathize with the made up people doing made up stuff on the page. I think the great scenes and the great moments of story allow the reader to really excel at that connectivity, at that empathy at that knowledge, at that similarity of feeling. If I were in that situation, I would do that too. I think that's what takes good to great. And I think when you're missing that empathy and you're missing that connectivity, I think that's where you run into situations where you're not reaching good. It's not wrong. You're not automatically bad, but it's not as effective as it could be. I think you can... You can really do a lot by making sure the reader not only is informed by what you write, but is also moving emotionally and um, dynamically through what you write. It's not enough to just inform them. He gets in the car. He goes to the store. Fine. But if we understand that he's racing because he doesn't want to, he's, he's worried about leaving his date in a lurch then all of a sudden the scene feels more impactful. Impact, I think, is measured by how a reader connects with the depth and the emotion of things. It's a wonderful question. I could probably do an entire whole thing just on that. Other questions? It's a really good question.
for the record podcast listeners, uh, I've gone through five glasses of water. This was a lot of talking. I'm, I'm surprised. I'm glad, but yeah. Other questions? Else we will get out of here. Yeah, let's get out of here. All right, everybody. Thank you sincerely for being here. Thanks for hanging out for an hour and 50 minutes. It was wonderful. Thank you for your questions. They were brilliant. Thanks for walking through all the parts with me. This recording will also be a podcast available in, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes or so, just wherever you get your podcasts, search for John helps you write better. Do the stream stay up on the channel? Yes. Every single thing I've ever recorded, every chat, every class, every stream, every everything is on the YouTube channel. Uh, some of them are under the live tab because I stream them straight. Others are just posted because I uploaded them. Cause if I do it on Twitch, I'm also available on Twitch. Um, I upload them to YouTube when I'm done, but all my streams forever are on this channel on YouTube, everything, all of it for years. Um, and it will continue to be that because I like doing it. And honestly, I like YouTube more than Twitch for this right now. Um, it's a lot easier for people to navigate. It's a lot easier for me to set up. I'm, I'm just happier. However, when I do it straight on YouTube, it ends up under the live tab as opposed to the regular tab. So if you're looking for something specific, don't forget to check that part of it because there's a ton of stuff. I've been doing this, you know, weekly for years. So there's hundreds of hours of material. If you did like this, if this was like a thing you're looking for, uh, like and subscribe. Click the bell for notifications. Do all the YouTube things that YouTubers more competent than me remind you to do constantly because um, I would love to keep doing this and you doing the algorithm feeding uh, makes that possible. I should also point out uh, if you like this and you want to suggest a thing for next time because I do this once a week or sometimes twice a week. Uh, if you ever want to suggest a thing, you can find me on social media. Uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, twitter.com forward slash awesome, A-W-E-S-O-M-E underscore J-O-H-N. Uh, if that, you know, you can suggest anything all the time. You can do it in the comments down in the YouTube. You can do it in chat. Whenever I'm here, make a suggestion. I'll literally put it on a list and don't be surprised if I end up doing it like immediately next week. If you like this and you want to see more, uh, the best way you can support everything I do Head over to patreon.com, patreon.com forward slash John helps you write better. Two bucks a month. You not only get all these streams, but you get extra stuff for two bucks a month. You get multiple other streams I do during the week. I uh, do a thing called watch movies write better where I do this, but for a movie, here's what works. Here's what doesn't. Here's this scene. Look at this goal. Look at all the stuff we just talked about. Imagine that for every scene in any movie you could probably think of. I do that too. Patreon.com forward slash John helps you write better. And if that weren't enough and all of this stuff is available, wherever you get a podcast, just search for John helps you write better. But if that weren't enough and you want help with whatever you're writing or making or filming or shooting or doing, head over to John helps you write better.com. And I will be happy to work with you on whatever it is you're doing, no matter who you are, where you're at or what you want to do. I've been doing this over 20 years. I want to help you tell your story. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Thanks for checking all this stuff out. Uh, this will be on YouTube forever and ever. It'll be on the podcast as audio in, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, however long it takes me to upload this audio. Thanks so much. I'll see you guys. One of my next time in your eyes and in your ears. Let's look at my calendar. Uh, I will be here one more time next week. Uh, next Tuesday, the 16th at 1 p.m. Eastern. I don't know yet what we'll talk about, but it'll be something. I'll see you then.
Thanks for being here. Take care. All power to all people. You deserve a good day. Go do something nice for yourself. And I'll talk to you soon. See ya.